Hello, and welcome to today's lesson in BCIT Technology Teacher Education, TTED 4044. This is our structures class, and uh, it's also, uh, in an engineering context, something that would be known as a statics class. And uh, so, anyway, we're going to be doing some calculations and figuring out how to keep buildings and structures and trusses and bridges in one place. And uh, last week we had an introduction where we talked about forces and moments and vectors and how to break a vector down into its component vectors. So if you've got a vector acting at an angle, you can get the horizontal and vertical components of that vector. You do the little vector dance here. Jason doesn't dance very well without practice, lots of practice. Um, anyway, so uh, today we're going to be doing some calculations here and then we're gonna wrap it all up by looking just down below me right there. And uh, you'll see a website called JF Matrix that's gonna help us check to make sure that we're getting all of our answers correct. So the other thing I wanted to take a look at is uh, the notes that I'm going to be using today are available for students in the class to go online to D2L and you can download those notes so that you can follow along, go into uh, Desire to Learn, our learning management system. And on the week two setting, you should find uh, both some lecture notes that look something like this, and also some problems to do that we're going to take a look at at the end of uh, this presentation. Okay, so um, we talked about breaking things down into uh, uh, into component vectors and really I've been trying to find that there's a perfect video out there on YouTube of somebody who sets up a zip line between a tree right here and a tree right here and they go down over top of a water hole and uh, you know they pull on the uh, the string at this end they pull on the string at that end and they think they're all good to go and they roll out into the middle and the trees collapse inwards like this because of course as they move along the zip line the forces that act uh, the horizontal vector components act uh, on the trees differently. So uh, <laughs> nature does its thing. And I've been looking for that. The only videos I can find of zip line collapses are all these horrible, tragic things where people get seriously hurt. And uh, I won't share a video uh, for, for, for the class, certainly not for entertainment purposes, if the injury is anything uh, more serious than something that requires another beer for first aid. Uh, so anyways, um, I'm looking for that video. I know it's out there. I've used it in the past and it's a great example of why understanding your component vectors and how they work in a very simple single triangle truss is really important. Later in the course, we're going to go on and take a look at multi-triangle trusses, but for today, we're just going to stick to the single truss and understand the forces that are at play inside um, a very simple structure. And here, I've got a tensile truss. Now, this is a little different from the trusses that you may have designed in your West Point Bridge Designer Challenge. Uh, of course, there you've got multiple triangles all joined together to make your truss, and some of them will be compressive and some of them will be tensile. But uh, here we've got uh, two nodes that are fixed right up here and right here. Okay, and we've got one right down here. Now in our lab, we're actually going to be uh, doing something like that this week and we're going to be using string coming down here. There'll be a weight hanging down here and we'll have a scale up here and we'll measure the force in each individual uh, string and then we'll say, oh, well, if that's our tensile force and this is our geometry, we'll calculate the vertical and horizontal vectors and confirm that physics works. I know you were worried about that, but uh, by going in and actually doing the hands-on tests, uh, that gives us some real numbers to play with when we're doing our math. Now, before we go and do that though, I want you to think a little bit about uh, which support, support A right here, or support B is going to be holding the greatest force, which of these two strings will be under the greatest force and why you think that might be. So maybe just pause this for a second, take a look at that. I am gonna give you the answer, but take a moment to think about that. Which one of these points 
is under greater force and why do you think it's under the greatest force okay did you press pause okay now you're back and we can take a look at why which one did you say well I like to use the friends carrying a couch analogy okay now instead of this being a couch if you help the friend move a couch okay Here's our coach. Very nice IKEA coach, right? There we go. And you now here's one person at this end holding that. And here's one person at this end holding that. And they're moving that coach along. And they're all very happy because the load of that coach is centered right in the middle and each of them is carrying 50% of the load of the coach. Kind of makes sense, right? It's just a dead load right in there. But then the third friend comes along and the third friend is um, not so helpful. Third friend comes along and sits on the coach right here, applying a force down right there. And here we have person A, and person B, and here we have dumb load C right here. Now, which person carrying that coach is going to swear at person C first? Well, obviously the person who needs to get the furniture moved is going to swear at person C first, but assuming they're all independent and equal parties in this thing, I've got a sneaking suspicion that it's gonna be person B swearing at person C first. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because since person C is closer to person B, more of uh, person C's weight is being borne by person B right on there. So person B has to work a little bit harder and support more load. And this applies to this structure right over here, because you can see that load C, point C, where the load is being applied, is closer to B than it is to A. So just as the person sitting on the couch is closer to B, okay, and therefore B is supporting more force, node B is supporting the greatest force as C is closer to B. And when I say closer, I'm talking about in the horizontal context because um, we've, we, we've got to balance this off and we say, what load do you expect to see at point A and what load uh, do you expect to see at point B? Well, right now, um, or which string is under the greatest tension? I should answer that first. Well, if we think this one is supporting the most load, then I think our string B C B as the greatest load and uh, what component vectors do you expect to see at point A and point B on there? Okay, so uh, now to take a look at this, and this is before we start calculating things in here and figuring it all out and explaining why it's all happening. We also want to take a look at what's going on right in here. So we're going to have a force acting on A, and that's going to be being point C is pulling down this way. And we're going to call this F A C. Okay. Now we'll also have C pulling down on point B with a force coming that way that we will call F B C the force between point B and point C. Now we can break these down into components and acting at A right here, okay, we'll have a vertical component and we'll have a horizontal component. And this vertical component coming down will be the vertical component of AC and we'll have a horizontal component. So I'm going to call that FAC in the Y direction because Y is our vertical. And over here I'll have FAC in the X direction. And likewise over here, 
we'll have f uh, b c in the x direction and f b c in the y direction okay so that means that when c pulls down on b right this way we can express that as the sum of a vertical and a horizontal component and we did our breaking down of vectors into their vertical and horizontal components last week okay um, so there we go same thing over at point a right here and uh, when we're acting at point c well of course this uh, component that's pulling down on a right here is also going to be pulling up on C because for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now something also has to be happening at A to hold that in place okay and we're going to call those reaction forces we'll talk about those in just a moment. So we expect to see at point A F A C X in the horizontal and F A C in the Y okay and at point B, we would expect to see F, B, C in the X direction and F, B, C in the Y direction. So we've got the main vector and then its components. And it's really important for solving this problem to be able to break things down into components. Okay, and there we've got that drawn out on the second page, simplifying it a little bit. Now. Since we know that's going to be happening right there, uh, when it comes time to start solving the truss, we need to know a couple of critical things that are going to happen in any truss. Now, uh, one of those is that the sum of all the forces is going to be equal to zero, and the other is that the sum of all our moments is going to be equal to zero. So in other words, if the sum of our forces doesn't all add up to zero, then our truss is going to start accelerating off in some direction or the other. It's going to go up or down or sideways. So we need to make sure that they all balance out to zero. And if the sum of our moments doesn't add up to zero, the truss is going to start rotating somewhere and it's going to spin around out of control and it will no longer be a static structure it will be a dy dynamic structure and instead of studying statics we'll be studying dynamics and kinematics instead of civil engineering it'll be mechanical engineering there's an old saying civil engineers build targets mechanical engineers build weapons shop teachers we build cool stuff sometimes it's a target sometimes it's a weapon I think you can break the world down into more than just targets and weapons, but anyway, uh, let's take a look right here. And we've got some calculations that we can go through to make sure that our structures are going to be balanced. Now, I almost always start, okay, with the sum of our moments being equal to zero. Now, there's a few little uh, things uh, that we need to take into account when we're doing this calculation. And uh, I'm actually going to grab a separate sheet of paper and just expand upon them a little bit for us here. OK, so when we take a look at this truss, we've got a point right here that we call A. We've got a point out here that we call B. And we know that there's a distance between them. And in the middle, we have this point C. Now you'll see what I've done right here is I've completely flattened this structure. And you can get away with that for your moment calculation so long as all your forces are perpendicular to that member, okay? Because the only time you can calculate a torque is when your force is perpendicular to the distance that you're looking at. And we know that this end and this end are secured and they can't be rotating. And we know that there is a load of 100 newtons acting down at point C right here. We also know that the distance from point A to point C is going to be 60. Could be centimeters, could be millimeters, could be miles. 
be a big truss if it was miles. And we know that since the distance out here is 40, that if we want to take a look at the moments about point A to keep it from pivoting about point A right here, because it can't be pivoting about any point in order for it to be a structure, we know that there's a moment arm of 100 from A out to B. So now when we go to calculate this structure, we've got a torque or a moment pushing down this way and the amount of the torque right there is 100 newtons times 60, we'll say, meters. Okay, so we'll say that is 6,000 newton meters. And counteracting it, we've got a force coming up that way. Now we don't know what the force is going to be coming up this way just yet. All we know is that 100 times this force coming up this way has to equal 6,000. So we can say that we've got F reaction, the reaction force at B pushing up that way, or sometimes I'll just call it F R X B, okay, times 100 has to be the equal and opposite of this torque right here. Otherwise, this one's going to pull it down or this one's going to push it up if these two aren't equal. So we can say that this torque right here is F R X B times 100. And we know that this moment has to be the same as this moment. We can say 6,000 Newton meters equals F R X B times 100, which means <clears throat> that F R X B divide both sides by 100. Okay, F R X B is going to equal 60 newtons. So I go through and do that calculation right down in this bottom corner here, but that corner ended up getting cut off and missed a, a few of the diagrams right down there. But what that means is that we're going to have, pushing up right here, 60 newtons, okay? Uh, in order to counteract what's pulling down on here, our vertical component right in here that we said was going to be F, B, C, Y, because we're going to have vertical and horizontal components acting in there. Now, if I've got 60 newtons acting up <clears throat> this way and a net of 100 newtons pulling things down, how much force do I need to have acting up at this end right here? Well, in order to have um, 100 newtons balanced out right here, I'm going to have to have <coughs> FAY, the force acting up there, equal to 40 newtons. Because our 40 plus our 60 has to equal 100. And that's what I calculate out right down here. Some of our forces equal zero. Okay, some of our forces in the X has to equal zero, meaning that the FAX there has to equal negative FBX. We'll figure out what those are in a little bit. And the sum of our forces in the Y direction has to be FAY plus BY plus the load. We take away 100 Newtons because the load is pointing downwards. And you do your math and FBY equals 100 Newtons minus FAY. We figured out FBY was equal to 60, so 100 newtons minus 40 gives us our 60. So now we've got <coughs> our triangle coming together a little bit right here. We can see we've got 40 newtons here, 60 newtons here, and that satisfies the couch arrangement right here because if the couch had the person 60% of the way that way and 40% of the way right there, this person's actually going to get 60% of the load, and this person's only going to get 40% of the load. So person B will swear first using our coach analogy. Alrighty.
moving on to page three right here. Here we go. We have that same equation that I just sketched out for you right here. We flatten everything out because it's a solid structure and we're interested in the forces acting at right angles. And we go through and do it again and derive our 40 newtons and our 60 newtons right here. Forgotten that I had that on the next page. All right, um, now this goes through and calculates it all out and gets us off to the starting point where we're going to take a look at what forces are acting in these strings right here. Okay, and we need to know to calculate that what horizontal components we're going to have acting at A and B. We've got the vertical components all balanced out by this point. Okay, let's take a look at the horizontal components. Now, we're going to zoom in on point A. Okay, and there's a few things that are happening at point A. So we've got uh, AY which we calculated had to be 40 newtons acting on the overall structure. And in fact, <clears throat> this is something that I said we'll call the reaction force. And that's the interaction with most cases, it's going to be the ground or the table. We'll just call this the surrounding environment. Okay, there is <clears throat> some structure or uh, element that is holding this point fixed in place, and to hold it fixed in place, it must push upwards with 40 newtons right there. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do is, <coughs> oh, oh, excuse me, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at just node A right here, and we're going to figure out everything that's going on in node A. So we've got this force right here that's acting up that we know has to be 40 newtons. Okay. Now, we do have a line um, coming over from point C over here that's going to be pulling this in this direction as well. Um, but we also have um, uh, FA x well that component is going to be uh well in this case um sorry we don't have a line running across i'm solving a different truss right there <laughs> the the reaction force here is also going to have a horizontal component holding it this way because our string is pulling it down this way so facx okay is going to be pulling it that way that's the horizontal component of fac right here that's being pulled down this way, okay? And we're gonna have FACY pulling it down this way. Now, in order to keep the structure from rotating, we had to have the sum of all the forces add up to zero. In order to keep each individual node from moving, we also have to have the sum of the forces at each node add up to zero. So if the ground has to push up with 40 Newtons right here, that means this string has to pull down with a vertical component also equal to 40 newtons on here to balance out those vertical components. Now, we know this is doing it at an angle, so we uh, are then able to figure out, using our vector components, what the horizontal component is going to be right in there. Okay, so we go through and talk about this right here. And now that we know that it's going to be 40 newtons, okay, acting at that point in, uh, from the string, we can use similar triangles to say, well, here is <coughs> FACY. This is our total FAC acting down in this direction. And then uh, we'll have FACX in here. So go ahead and take your measurements from that original drawing. Okay, we had our original drawing right back over here on the first page. And you can see that our measurements on the first page, we said it was 60 over to this point and 50 down to this point. So from A is 50 down and 60 over. 
Okay, that was what was on the uh, first page right there. And that allows us to do a Pythagoras calculation and get 78.1 millimeters for our hypotenuse. Using similar triangles, okay, we know that ACY and the 50 millimeter side are the same part of the similar triangle. So the ratio between FACY and 50 millimeters is going to be the same as the ratio between FACX and 60 millimeters and the ratio between FAC and 78.1 millimeters over there, the size that we calculated for the hypotenuse. Now there's a number of ways to go through and solve all this. I like to find the ratio and say that if 40 newtons to 50 millimeters is 0 0.8, then I can multiply this distance by 0 0.8 <clears throat> to get 48 newtons, this distance by 78, uh, this 78.1 by 0 0.8 to give me 62.5 newtons. So what we'll be looking at in our final structure is if FACY is um, the 40 newtons that we calculated, okay, then FAC, our total structure, is going to be 62.5 and FACX is going to equal 48. Now, at the bottom of the page, I ask one of those awful questions. Stop and think. Does that make sense? Sometimes I get stuff wrong when I'm talking about this, and entirely unironically, it doesn't make sense because I've screwed up. I think I've got it right this time, and it should make sense that this is greater than this because this distance right here is greater than this distance right here, and our longest distance has the highest force in it. You know, if you check those things and you understand what you're doing, um, then sometimes when you make a silly math error, it stands out. And it's always good after you do a math calculation to stop and say, is that going to make sense? Does that balance out? Does the longest side have the greatest force in it? Does the shortest side have the shortest force in it? And if you really want to check, you can do Pythagoras and check to make sure that 40 squared plus 48 squared equals 62.5 squared. Because triangles are triangles. And Pythagoras, even after all these years, is still right. Despite what his partner may have told him. Okay, so sure it does. It makes sense. And uh, there is our triangle with all the dimensions in there. Everything is proportional. Uh, to the dimensions of the triangle. The forces are proportional to the dimensions. Okay, now the longest side of the triangle experiences the greatest forces. Now we're going to come in here and we're going to solve for point B. Okay, we just solved for point A. Uh, let's take a look at point B. And over on point B, we've got a lot of the same forces acting, except we've replaced the letter A with a B. Okay, so on point B, we have BC uh, X, okay, because we've got this string pulling down here, and we call that FBC, pulling in this direction now. We calculated earlier that our reaction force at FB, the force from the surrounding environment pushing up on point B, is going to be 60 newtons. Okay, and we don't quite know what force is going to be pulling over that way, pulling or pulling over that way, but it's pretty easy to figure out that um, the vertical components right here need to balance out. One is pushing up, the other one's pulling down. We calculated that to be 60 newtons, so pushing down, we have negative 60 newtons, and that lets us come up with our similar triangles, just like we did last time. And here we've got point B, here we've got point C, okay? Our measurements, 50 millimeters here, 40 millimeters here, do some Pythagoras, 64 millimeters right there, and scale your triangles. So we go through 
write all this out. And yes, there are shortcuts. You don't always have to write everything out when you're just doing a quick solution, but I really recommend that you get in the habit of writing things out uh, because when you're explaining to your students what's going on, you want to give them a document of step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step processes. And when you're doing it on a test or a quiz or an assignment for me, you want to get in the habit of having everything all laid out. So if you make a silly mathematical error, I can find your silly mathematical error and say, oh, they hit six on the calculator instead of nine this time. And that's why they made a mistake. They should have caught it, but I can give them part marks because they understand what they were doing right there. Okay, so uh, here's our proportions. Here's our ratios. FBCY is to 50, as BCX is to 40, as FBC is to 64. Okay, remember that's all just coming off the previous page where we laid these two triangles out. And since we know that the there's 60 newtons acting in the 50 millimeter direction, the ratio is going to be 1.2. And so we can multiply the 40 millimeter distance by 1.2, the 64 millimeter distance by 1.2, and we get all of our forces. So finally, we can take a look at point C and we can see if this all adds up. Okay, now if I look at point C, remember I've got one string pulling up this way and one string pulling up that way. Okay. The string on this side is lifting up with 40 newtons, and the string on this side is lifting up with 60 newtons because of our couch analogy. This side was closer to C, and this side was further away from C. Okay. Um, the key point right here, however, is that when we do these calculations, the horizontal components also balance out. Because if I didn't have balanced horizontal components, this part would start to slide to one side or to the other side. So you need to balance out those horizontal components as well as balancing out the 40 and 60 and 100 right there. This gives us an overall structure for our little tensile truss right here, where we've got two nodes tied in right here. And uh, we've got a reaction force of 40 Newtons here, 48 Newtons of horizontal force being put into the environment. And right here, we've got B, 48 Newtons of horizontal force going into that environment right there. Now, I said that the beginning, that there's a problem if you don't understand how this works and you go and set up a zip line or a slack line. Because generally in your zip line or your slack line, you don't have this much uh, deviation. In fact, you try to get it as close as you can with only a tiny little deviation right in here. And now you've got an issue on your triangles because your triangle, oh, great job, should have used a ruler to draw that in there. Your triangle right now has a very small vertical measurement right in here, which means that if you've got 40 Newtons acting over a tiny little vertical measurement, that you're gonna have a big ratio between your triangles and that means that whatever force is acting in here is going to be greatly, greatly, greatly magnified. Now, if you pull down out here, that won't be that big of a deal because it'll still be really vertical. So when you test your slack line right here, it won't be a big deal. But as you slide out into the middle and your zip line gets over top of the lake, that's going to increase the force acting horizontally on right there and topple your trees into the pond, sending you down, giving everybody a good laugh. And like I say, injuries that can be, you know, roughly cured by having another beer. For those people who are of age, if you're watching that, I put this video is not made for children on the uh, thing right here. Now, one last page on here. That was a tensile truss like you'd see with a slack line or a zip line. Let's flip this around and make it a compressive truss, like you'd see right here, if the load's up at the top and you've got two members in compression, and you can kind of picture that truss popping out towards the bottom. Now, on this truss, I've used a couple of diagrams um, that you maybe haven't seen too much before. I've got uh, this point right here with a little triangle and the slash marks. That indicates that this is free to pivot about this point so it can rotate 
around here and both those members can rotate but they can't move up and down and they can't move side to side over here I've got it drawn in but with rollers underneath it okay now this is still free to pivot and it can't move up or down but the rollers allow it to slide side to side meaning that the environment will allow it to slide side to side this member a C across the bottom tries to keep it from sliding from side to side it's important that we have rollers on one end of the truss because that simulates what happens in a real-world environment where when you've got a triangle like this acting right in here it is going to want to bow out towards the bottom and as you'll recall from material science class last semester when you pull on something it stretches okay elastic might only be a tiny little bit of elastic stretching but there is going to be deformation happening right in there when you pull on it and there is going to be compression happening vertically when you push on it all right um, so you can take a look at that and uh, you can uh, uh, do a calculation and you can go through and uh, figure out all of the math and how much stress there is in each member which members are in compression because they're being pushed inwards and which members are in tension because they're being pulled outwards and you can start to see how uh, Steve, Colonel uh, Ressler and the design team for West Point Bridge Designer went through and started developing the software for solving their bridge they were a little bit more complex than that you can also if you're not sure if you got the answer right, go ahead and try solving that. If you're not sure you got the answer right when you got through to the end of it, you can check. And in order to check, um, let me just pop this up a little bit bigger and slide it over right here. And oh, good, this is what happened last time I was recording. It didn't. Um, it didn't record that properly and I really need a studio technician here to manage my uh, recording equipment and to remember to push all the buttons so I don't have to record it over again okay here we go this is on desire to learn right now this is what uh, the current uh, page looks like for uh, for uh, 20 uh, uh, 2021 January in week two you should be able to have download our uh, lecture notes uh, that I was using today. There's some simple practice trust questions that you can go through and solve. And then either this week or next, depending which group you're in, you'll be in here for a tensile structural load lab where we'll do some of these calculations again. But what I'd like to do right now is take a look at this web page called JF Matrix. And let me just make sure, there we go, I'm recording that. It is full screen on here. So I can switch over here and use JF Matrix. Now, uh, JF Matrix doesn't always have the easiest interface, but it's a site that's provided for free and does allow us to perform a number of structural calculations. So we're gonna take a look at how we could go about using it to solve this truss. So when you come to JF Matrix, make sure you click on the Truss Analysis button. Now, if you've been solving a truss in the past, uh, you can see that your last truss that you solved will pop up through the magic of cookies right here. This was something that we were solving for uh, last year's uh, truss design challenge. And I am going to right now just uh, edit, and, uh, let's see, it'll pop a new model in there. Yes, we want to create a new model. Here we go. So in JF Matrix, um, Oh, they've started adding, and I don't know whether they got hacked and this page came in, uh, but uh, a little ad flashes up in there. So <clears throat> I don't know whether that's intentional or a hack or something in there, but if that keeps happening, um, I may be looking for uh, new software in the future. But JF Matrix, anyways, it's pretty good. Now, the first thing you're going to do in here, uh, make sure you're in truss mode, okay? And if you clicked on the truss button, you should see this little truss icon highlighted in green right here. Next, come along right here and tell it you want to draw some joints. So if we're solving that problem on the sheet of paper, uh, we're going to put one node right there. That'll be our top node. It's B on our drawing. And then we'll come down from there 
and one, two, three, four. And this one, it looks to me like uh, it's equilateral. So it's going to be uh, two and a half out. Uh, no, what's it going to be out to each side? Oh, you have to do a quick bit of math and say 50 squared minus 40 squared. We're going to be one, two, three out to that side. Come down here and one, two, three out to that side. There's our nodes in there for our nice little equilateral triangle. You can use the hand button here to move around. You've got a zoom button for scrolling. And uh, let's draw some beams in here next. Okay, and connect the beams from one node to the next, to the next, to the next. And when you're all done, uh, what you could do is just hit escape. Okay, and that should give you the links right in here. That one, oh, that's actually the beam numbers showing up in there. You can get the beam links elsewhere. Alrighty, and just use the hand to move that back up into the center of the screen, kind of over there where it's easy to see. Now what you're gonna do is you're going to put your constraints on it. And we've got these roller supports that uh, hold your tr um, node steady in the y direction. So you come down to this node right here, and there's a roller support applied right there, and then a hinged support that's going to come on that node right there. Okay, so now we've got this node fixed, and this node uh, unable to rotate. It can slide in and out this way, but that's what this member down here, member three is for, is to keep it from sliding out that way. Now that you've got that in there, you're going to want to apply some forces. And this one uh, that says draw joint loads is how you apply your forces. And we're going to have a load of negative 120 acting on it. Now I think it's going to apply this as kilonewtons. If you zoom in right on there, it says 120 kilonewtons. Uh, we'll just assume it means 120 newtons because um, it's equally scaled throughout the entire structure, it's not going to be a big problem. So now we've got our nodes in place at the correct locations. We've got our members joining the nodes properly. We've applied our constraints. So the program knows how the structure is going to, um, well, react with its environment. And now what you can do is you can come in here and you can click on the play button and that runs the analysis and it comes out and it looks like this, which doesn't actually tell you anything at all until you click on the A button right there. And you'll see some familiar colors that you're used to seeing. And you can even click on the play button right now and it animates your deflection. And you can see right here, the impact that that roller node is having is that if it's stretching, it's stretching from right here because it is completely pinned at this corner right here. And when we apply a bit of load on here, these shrink. Now the animation is not to scale. It's massively exaggerated so that you can see what's going on, but it gives you an idea of how everything moves. And uh, we'll just click on A right here and that gets rid of that. Now, uh, you do have to zoom in a little bit right on here and you'll see on this side, we've got 75 Newtons. I know it says kilonewtons, but that's because we applied a kilonewton load. We've got 75 right there. So in compression, we have equal loads because the uh, lengths of these two members are equal. And down at the bottom, we've got 45 newtons in tension. Now, one of the classic questions that people have is they'll go through and they'll calculate their structure and they'll have 45 newtons pulling out that way and they'll find 45 newtons pulling that way. And they'll say, well, if I pull that way with 45 and I pull that way with 45, why don't I see 90 newtons? And it's a good question. Now, usually 45 plus 45 would equal 90. Except here's the thing. You can't have 45 newtons of tension in this direction, unless you also have 45 newtons of tension in this direction. The two have to balance each other out. Your tension in the line is 45. It just happens to be acting at two different points. 
Think about the scale in your bathroom when you go stand on the scale to get weighed. Okay, pretend the mouse is the scale right here. Um, hope I didn't bump. Don't use the mouse. I don't want to bump on something. And uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's uh, let's pretend my infrared camera is the scale right here. Okay, uh, suitably blobby object. Now I'm going to weigh that pencil. And the scale will tell me that the pencil weighs 100 grams. Probably not the best thing that we weigh on a bathroom scale, but you're standing on top of here. There you go. Person standing on the scale says that you weigh 100 kilograms. That's because your body is exerting 100 kilograms on the top of the scale, pushing it downwards. But you'll notice that the scale's not accelerating downwards. That's because the floor is pushing right back up with a force of 100 kilograms. The scale is only bearing a force of 100 kilograms, even though it has 100 pushing down and 100 pushing back up. That's because you couldn't have 100 pushing down unless you did have 100 pushing back up. If you had 100 pushing down and only 80 pushing back up, then your scale would drop downwards. Same thing when you're looking at something in tension. If I'm pulling out this way with 45 newtons or kilonewtons or pounds or whatever units you want to have, the only way that can happen without this thing suddenly accelerating off to the side is if I'm pulling this way with an equal and opposite reaction. And we can thank Newton for that. He's one of those guys who actually did deserve to get something named after him. He came up with some really cool stuff. Okay, so um, you've got a problem on this page that you can go through and calculate. You're going to use the exact same techniques that we used on the rest of our document. And if you want to know if you got the answer right, well, we just solved it here in JF Matrix. I've also got, um, let me change my uh, video capture device to, comes back up on top. There we go. I've also got uh, some problems up on D2L for you to solve, and they look something. Got them around here somewhere, like this. It says practice trusses at the top of the page right here. Okay, and you can go through, and if you want to get some practice on this, go ahead and download uh, these. I do have answers for all of them, but now that you know how to use JF Matrix, checking your work should be fairly easy. Um, you can always uh, drop me a message if uh, it's not coming through and not making sense. I can go through and uh, provide a solution for uh, any one of these, uh, or two, or three, or four. But uh, try solving some of them on your own right here. So here you've got 100 newtons acting down on a structure that is three high, two meters here, and four meters right there. Your first step is going to be to say, how much force do I have acting here? and here and for that you go back and you say well let's do the couch calculation okay and uh, well i'll let you figure it out from there remember you've got to figure out that the sum of the force acting up here is going to plus the sum of the force here is going to add up to 100 and you're going to have moments so that this isn't rotating about this way after that, you're going to take a look at what vectors you have and what component vectors you have, and then you're going to start scaling things up so you can figure out how much compressive force you have there, how much compressive force you have right there, and how much tensile force you have acting in the bottom. Now this one's going to be the exact same thing, except we've really shortened that height. You're going to get a lot more force acting in there because these horizontal members well, these more horizontal members, they do have a vertical component, aren't as efficient at carrying vertical load as these members right here. On the next page, you'll see that we've got this applied in a slightly different structure. These two joints are pinned to the wall and you're hanging a sign out here at the end. Okay, you're going to have to do the same thing on this one. You're going to have to say, well, if I don't want it to pivot about this point right here, and I've got a moment 500 newtons acting at 9 meters here, then 
but A, I have to be pulling this into the wall, okay? And uh, the wall right here, you're going to have to do a bit of math because we've got, uh, you're going to have the uh, square root of 10 squared minus 9 squared is going to be that height right in there. So when you know that height right there, you'll be have to say that this force times this distance is equal to this force times this distance. Otherwise, it's going to start rotating down this way. Okay, so you can put your pencil on a node, say, where is it rotating? What's making it rotate? And balance those all out. And finally, I've got a slack line question for you right here. And this would apply to a zip line too. And uh, this person causes a tiny little deflection of 15 centimeters after three meters. So your triangle right in here is going to be a very, very flat one. Okay, this member right here is not going to be slack at all. It's going to be very, very taut. And you'll be able to calculate how much force is being applied to this tree over here. And when you start thinking about it and people are setting up their slack lines, you'll see that your slack lines say, don't put it around a high point on the tree. Okay, now it depends on the tree that you're talking about, but for a lot of trees, the amount of horizontal force that you're going to generate out here is many times your body mass. And the higher you put it up on the tree, the greater the torque that you generate about the base of the tree, and the more likely you are to have the tree topple over. Same thing goes for street signs and things like that. Okay, folks, uh, there you go. Sorry about the delay on getting this video up here. Uh, next year it won't be delayed. It'll be ready and waiting to go. But uh, ran into a little bit of a recording glitch at home, and uh, hopefully this one's come through nice and clear for you.